So a graphic array is this artwork by Aaron Barthel explores the phenomena of infrastructural fragmentation. Uh, consisting of paper sheets that are layered as pads according to different contemporary screen as aspect ratios, uh, the piece documents the diversification of digital interfaces as they've proliferated over the past decade. Um, so spanning you know, a whole range, oh, it's quite light, but these are sheets of paper. So um, uh, spanning a whole range of different um, screen ratios, um, it kind of documents the real estate of consumer electronics today, um, the visual real estate. Um, and in, in doing so, it's kind of like picking up on this process of, of fragmentation and splintering that you see um, with the amount of uh, different uh, technologies that are being plugged into uh, internetworking protocols. Um, this sense of fragmentation kind of arises from uh, retrospectively um, in that uh, the in the beginning of the 2000s, there was a kind of stabilization um, in uh, web uh, technologies where a dominant system configuration uh, tended to characterize end, uh, the, the end devices. So there's one browser, uh, Internet Explorer 6, uh, one platform, uh, Windows XP, and one screen resolution, uh, which was uh, 1024 by uh, 768. So this could be taken as a basic uh, starting point, really, um, for any number of projects uh, that designers uh, might have undertaken. And uh, they would utilize a, a, a 960 pixel grid basically that would kind of feed into that stable um, structure. Um, but following uh, market diversification and the widespread take up of mobile smart technologies, building sites and interfaces has become decidedly more complicated. So we might think of, for instance, just the um, diversity across uh, Apple's product line. And here, you know, it's just a, a single instance of um, some of the 2015 uh, devices, but of course there's many iterations on each one of these product lines as well in terms of screen size. You know, and this is you know, uh, not even mentioning you know, the, the amount of diversity you find in the Android ecology. Um, so Barthol's work um, speaks to these conditions, but it does it in a kind of post-digital way. Um, so it interprets these competing standards in paper leaf form, and in doing so, it's invoking legacies of publishing and engineering norms through a kind of, de it's a deceptively simple act of media translation. Um, so these standards, uh, these historical standards in publishing are kind of invoked in their displacement. Um, but the piece still ironically performs a kind of virtue of contemporary design in that it still synthesizes um, all of this diversity into a kind of singular expression. You know, it's a kind of contemporary uh, virtue of user experience design that I'm gonna refer to in the talk as responsiveness. So uh, faced with the kind of diverse potentials and affordances of standardizations, designers aim to kind of take the measure of informational flows. So this is a well-recognized ideal in the field of web design. As opposed to the possibilities of paper, working with an informational milieu uh, requires a necessity to uh, embrace the ebb and flow of things. Um, indeed, as Alan Liu has noted in his landmark text, The Laws of Cool, the modernist principles of design that still inform uh, web design practices are frequently frustrated by anti-design forces as technical standards intermingle and clash across the network. So in response, cool sites are, quote, those that recognize the spatio-temporal disturbances of the medium, but then accommodate those disturbances through clever visual metaphors or coding techniques that create a facade of a whole uh, harmonium, end quote. So this is a kind of craftiness um, that's present, uh, that you can see present across, for instance, approaches in the 90s uh, that used graceful degradation to traverse a variety of browser versions. Um, one might also think about uh, progressive enhancement techniques where, basic, where you build a baseline solution to a project that's sort of automatically enriched um, depending on the functionality and features of more cutting edge systems. Um, but this recent uh, proposal by uh, designer uh, Ethan Marcotte um, has really kind of come to dominate the current discourse uh, with the idea of responsive web design that deals with fragmentation by using flexible grids, flexible media images, uh, and the potential for CSS3 media queries to, to sculpt a universal interface channel. So the investment in layout ratios kind of it gives way to a new liquidity here where content adapts, shrinks, stretches and responds to a device or a user agent. 
Aiming for this ideal involves a whole bunch of other strategies that I'll just mention quickly. The idea that you would concentrate on mobile first because it's easier to expand um, from, that, from those constraints of limited screen real estate. Um, and there's also this, uh, these pretty, pretty complicated questions about how you deal with payload, uh, how much uh, uh, data and content is being delivered into devices and how much of that data and content is actually rendered on screen. Um, so there's a whole range of techniques for dealing with that. Um, but arguably, I want to suggest that these kind of technical tricks are extensions and supplements to modernist formats and graphic design. But they also arguably invite a new theorization of the centripetal and centrifugal aesthetics of the grid, as Rosalind Krauss um, has famously put it. Um, so in this emerging paradigm, all that solid melts into responsiveness. Um, my presentation aims to reflect on these techniques through a number of historical observations. So in general, I want to consider how grids have been conceptualized critically and aesthetically as a process of rationalization in design. Um, central to this discussion is the notion that grids can function as kind of propositional indexes of space and time. Um, and they allow for a, a, what I want to call a programmable synthesis of disparity. Um, so what do I mean by this? Like, first of all, I want to consider how grids allow, have allowed for the unification of both symmetry and asymmetry in communication strategies and design, what might be consider, considered signal and noise. Secondly, I want to consider how grids have facilitated notions of programmability to enter into design discourses. And finally, I want to consider how they've uh, produced an image of meta-design in the sense that it, the grid can uh, become a network in a relational sculpted, sculpting of forces that are taken as found within the environment. So I'm going to chart out this lineage, um, and I'm interested in what happens to politics uh, in the attempt to outpace fragmentation, to, to unify contradictions or even antagonisms you know, before they're fully manifest, in the pursuit of what uh, we might call the right distribution of things, you know, to kind of riff on Foucault's idea of, or the right integration of things, rather than the right distribution of things, as Foucault might put it. Okay, so uh, it's really hard not to mention uh, the influence. I'm going to skip just a quick section, but the uh, the influence of uh, this text uh, from Jan Tischold, the new typography. Um, in the utilization of the grid for layout formats um, at the turn of, uh, or early uh, last century. Um, so it, at stake in this canonical text, which essentially uh, formalized and generalized uh, the experiments of the historic avant-garde into uh, a program for visual communication, at, at stake is uh, a, a search for a systematic approach um, to visual uh, and textual communication um, that links together aesthetics and functionality. Um, I'm really interested in how uh, design is kind of born from, yeah, this moment where uh, uh, sort of use, value, and aesthetics are unified together as somehow um, these domains that uh, are outside or they're reservoirs of autonomy from the more kind of violent, uh, contradictory forces in modernity. So in a way, design reaches into both romantic discourses and uh, socialist and Marxist understandings of use value as being you know, somehow uh, uh, outside of or um, in parallel to the commodity form and kind of brings them together in, in, in an early utopian kind of projects. Um, so in this text, uh, the main task for Tischold involved a careful balancing act between visual tensions and asymmetries in the, in the design of books, pamphlets, posters, and also bureaucratic documents. So um, the grid became crucial in this balancing act in holding together um, these dual investments in aesthetics and use value as a synthetic whole. Um, so it's worth noting that the text is shot through with a kind of socialist set of investments as well that, you know, it's, so it's really kind of a product of its time. Uh, the book is published, uh, you know, in Germany in 1928. Um, and the idea was that the logical and formal investments in the grid and these asymmetries that were nevertheless homogenized could erode away forms of bourgeois individualism in the pursuit of a kind of universal collectivity. 
Um, so crucially, in the aftermath of the Second World War, Tischhold would disown this work altogether. Um, he, he would claim that it was based on an intolerant attitude. You know, this is one of the famous kind of uh, layout images on appropriate layout. So yeah, don't do kind of homogenized layouts, have asymmetric layouts. Um, so he would claim that it was based on an intolerant attitude and an inclination to the absolute that co corresponded with a militarized will to order through the endorsement of a sole power to communication. So this is like my first uh, kind of vignette, if you like, the idea of the, um, the, the grid that operates as synthesis. Um, interestingly, by using the grid in this way, um, Tischhold also kind of unleashed a new expediency in creative labor, the way it could be performed. The grid implied a kind of perpetual motion machine for the, product, for the production of interesting content. So while Tischhold would kind of loosen up his approach to layouts and typography, and typography, later Swiss designers like Emil Ruder or Josef Müller-Brockmann seized upon the grid um, that was outlined in the new typography to elaborate what we might now recognize as archetypal, archetypal expressions of graphic design. But particularly important in this context, I want to suggest, is the work of Carl Gerstner, um, particularly his influential compound grid for the 1960s publication Capital. Uh, so it's this uh, grid here. Um, so this was a magazine that was published to explore and explain to a broad audience the economic intricacies of mid-20th century consumer societies. Um, and it did so by utilizing this uh, overlapping asymmetric configurations that really turned the modernist grid that uh, Tischhold was, um, was experimenting uh, with into uh, quite an elaborate and Baroque apparatus. Um, but it's his conceptual reflections on the approach that um, uh, I'm particularly interested in, in, to the extent that he contextualized the methods within, uh, within the terms of uh, early algorithmic art. Um, in particular, you know, he, he talks at length in, in his reflections on this, uh, uh, on this technique. Um, it, he talks at length in, uh, of uh, work by, for instance, Fieder Nake, experimental music by Karl Stockhausen, uh, and John Cage, and also early Fluxus uh, uh, works. Um, all, of these, uh, all of these kind of different projects that uh, Gerstner is interested in are based on generative processes. So they're expressions of conceptual and software art. Um, and he frames all of these in, ter in, term in this concept he calls uh, you know, designing programs. Um, so all of these uh, different examples that he brings together are based on algorithmic executable instructions, despite not being uh, reducible to digital technology. So you know they're examples of kind of algorithmic um, you know thinking uh, and conceptual thinking that don't require digital techniques uh, technologies to necessarily be executed. Um, so Gerstner's work, uh, it can be argued, takes this coupling of aesthetics and functionality a step further into the regime of computation. In this case, the algorithmic flexibility of the grid as a production technique plays out in a balancing act whereby functional constraints drive creative labor. The groundwork is laid here for folding these techniques into raster grids for, later graphic, for the later graphic user interface especially prevalent in the introduction of uh, what you see is what you get paradigms in desktop publishing, most notably the uh, Aldous page maker for the Apple Macintosh in 1984, which lives on today as Adobe InDesign. Um, yet in Gerstner's uh, reflections and experimentation with grids from the early 60s, we can also catch a glimpse of some kind of disconcerting undercurrents in the cold seduction of the algorithm. As Florian Kramer puts it, this is a quote, terror grounded in the simultaneity of minimist, minimalist concept notation and totalitarian execution, end quote. So Gerstner himself would later quit his active in, uh, role in a successful creative agency, GKK, which he co-founded um, during this uh, highly creative period, um, in that he was dismayed with the obvious contradictions that he saw emerging with Bauhaus ideals as they intersected with the economic forces that they were supposed to curtail or outpace. Um, in particular, the way these techniques were so easily subsumed into advertising, planned obs obsolescence, kitsch, and other consumer trends. So he effectively went into a state of semi-retirement to focus solely on fine art practice at the start of the 1970s. So that's the second kind of vignette, uh, the programmable grid.
Um, this is the, the last uh, idea of the, the grid I want to think about. The grid as a network. Um, so here I want to consider the expansion of relational epistemologies of design or meta-design frameworks during the 1960s as a way to um, further transcend what was now recognized as a crisis in Bauhaus um, uh, ideologies. And here I want to briefly consider a small group of French design theorists that include Abraham Moles and Henry Van Leer, who attempted to surpass this uh, impasse um, in design thinking through cybernetic conceptions of relational and transductive forces. Um, a key influence on their writing was Gilbert Simondon's publication on the mode of existence of technical objects. Um, the idea was to design for an ensemble of objects rather than designing a single object um, and move from what Simondon described in his work as abstract machines to concrete machines in a transition that would move from the alienated conditions of industrial labor to the formation of a uh, associated post-industrial milieu. So for Moles and Van Leer, operationalizing this account would mean moving design practices into the register of meta-design by considering correspondences between entities, objects and objects, objects and subjects, objects and others. Um, and to evolve uh, a, a, a syntax, an adaptable syntax, syntax of things. Um, so they took inspiration from a number of artistic and design practices in this proposition, including sculptural works by Max Bill, um, which yields a kind of impression of topology of, uh, from abstract geometric objects, um, or the modular furniture of Rittfeld, where intersecting components and struts imply a centrifugal expansion of grid structures to other potential formations and architectures. As the design historian Larry Bus Busby writes in his account of this moment, which I'm drawing on quite heavily, um, it's a really great uh, essay uh, that I can give the reference to if anyone's interested. Um, so as he writes, these object uh, ecologies proposed by meta-design theorists were meant to form a spatial network, a sphere of life in which the post-industrial citizen dwelled. Um, and it advocated an overarching idea of progressive integration, quote, the greater the technical and semiotic convergence of objects in the built environment, the more fully man could be a productive part of the system, end quote. Um, significantly, the tools for constructing this associated milieu um, was a kind of litany of uh, Cold War era uh, computational technologies and techniques, machines that would design automatically, combina combinatory processes, game theory, and listing. The proposal for meta design, however, um, was additionally greeted with harsh critiques from um, some corners at the time. So forming part of his larger project on the political economy of the sign, Jean Baudrillard would target directly the work of the meta-designers, um, Moles and Van Leer, for naively believing that aesthetics and use value in the rationale of the Bauhaus could be so easily transcended, could so easily be detached from modes of exchange. So the forced participation of an integrated network envisaged by meta-design would, in his account, only further exacerbate modes of social experiences of social alienation. As Baudrillard ironically observed, quote, an aesthetic ensemble is a mechanism without lapses, without fault, in which nothing compromises the interconnection of the elements and the transparency of the process. That famous absolute le legibility of signs and messages, the common ideal of all manipulators of codes, whether they be cyberneticians or designers, end quote. Um, so it's noteworthy that the legacies of uh, cybernetics and information design um, were in a contemporaneous, com contemporaneous moment being elaborated into integrative uh, network systems by Vinton Cerf and Robert E. Kahn at DARPA at precisely this moment, where they were considering um, a schema for protocols um, that we now know as TCP IP um, that would precisely rely on a syntax for universal networking or internetworking. Um, we can also recognize uh, in, within this context the kind of irony of uh, Tim Berners-Lee simplifying standard generalized markup languages in the development of the World Wide Web, which would later be expanded into extensible markup languages to use metadata um, to go beyond the display of content but, and uh, provide also the possibilities for multiple informational outputs. You know, so really are, are these kind of moments in uh, the development of the computer science of uh, networking um, based both around you know, internetworking but the separation of form and content 
um, with metadata are somehow realizing what meta designers were talking about in relation to how industrial objects should be built um, for consumer societies. But of course, it's unfolding in a completely different context, um, indeed, uh, a different continent. Um, but here we find a different design paradigm of meta design, an arrangement of markup and data transfers um, that comes to be understood um, as facilitating trans a transcendent logic that, as Alan Liu has argued, foregrounds the significance of integrative digital interfaces, along with the paradoxes of programmable synthesis that you can already see um, in this kind of design uh, thinking. Uh, and I have a long quote from Alan Liu, but I'm going to skip it because it's also a bit dense. Um, but it's from the Transcendent Data essay uh, that I can uh, uh, recommend to you. Um, OK, but uh, just taking account of these brief vignettes into the history of design, we might then think about theorizations of the web that have been quite influential, like those of Tetsiana Terranova, precisely in terms of transductive and transitive information flows, drawing from Simondon, but also what's been described as a shift from Euclidean social imaginaries to the moving ratio of a topological culture. You know, in this worldview, uh, which is enacted through digital network technologies today, uh, we could stress how the dyna dynamism um, of topography and fluidity is additionally valued, performed, and judged on aesthetic and functional grounds within contemporary interface design. So in a way, kind of playing out um, the legacies of, um, of these earlier investments and in, uh, modes of thinking about design. So as, uh, as Marcotte puts it in his proposal for, um, for uh, responsive web design, quote, we can embrace the flexibility inherent to the web without surrendering the control we require as designers, end quote. Responsiveness in this respect can be seen arising from digital network mobile devices as they are perceived to be innately flexible. Emphasizing the inherent qualities of the web as a medium in this case, I'd argue abstracts and idealizes particular techniques and technologies, um, especially as they've been historically elaborated through this kind of lineage, but it does so precisely in relation to co the contradictions of competing forces of production in a reaction to fragmentation. So I'm saying like you need to, we need to start basically thinking about um, economy uh, the political economy of exchange uh, in relation to uh, these, these practices. Um, so enacting flexibility begins to count as a socio-technical form because of this kind of relationship to political economy. Um, to this extent, design strategies of responsiveness can be seen to accompany what Tartan Gillespie has described as the politics of platforms whereby service-based corporations like YouTube, but also Facebook, Google, Twitter, um, in this case, Microsoft, um, must contend with and attempt to placate the diverse con constituencies that are brought together through their business models onto the platform. So you have this kind of you know, programmable synthesis um, you know, that's being uh, enacted. Uh, interestingly, oh, I'm going to keep it here. Um, while there is no inherent sort of technical links to paradigms like, for instance, Google's material design or the shift to flat design, and hopefully you're familiar with these kind of ideas, uh, it's that uh, if you remember what uh, interfaces looked like um, you know, 20 years ago, there was this idea of a kind of uh, a metaphor of objects that you'd interact with that have been uh, flattened out um, and kind of pressed down uh, into uh, what is arguably uh, a, a design mode of thinking more in line with that early modernism of Tischold. Um, so you have this kind of uh, flat design that emerges. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's no technical reason to do this, um, but uh, it's tied precisely to the economic trajectory that combines together users and devices with platforms. So as Matthew Fuller has recently discussed, with the one-to-one -one correlation of personal computers with platforms, the, the traditional skeomorphic design metaphors of the interface are dropped. And instead, you get this notion that you respond to real-time flows by acting uh, direct, instead of acting directly on metaphoric objects. So as you shift to data and services, there's a kind of what uh, Fuller calls a lean-back kind of aesthetic, 
which replaces the lean forward mode of earlier interface interaction. Um, but in this instance, the legacies of ergonomics that converge with responsiveness mean that user populations also come to be understood differently. So like the meta designers, user, population, user populations become um, imagined as bound up in participatory logics that also try to achieve a synthesis um, with uh, you know, optimization paradigms, with the kinds of uh, investments in uh, behavioral economics and uh, what I'm calling here custodial post-humanism, you know, that have been kind of discussed uh, throughout this event. Um, so ironically, the, pr the predominance of user-centered design paradigms actually betrays a paternal need to know users, but only from the perspective of the meta design. So here, responsiveness comprehends an environment as wanting, as desiring, and perhaps even unruly or disillusioned, but it enlists them into economy of relations um, that, uh, to recall a phrase by Herbert uh, Simon, is more concerned with satisficing. So it's more about a condition of being satisfactory and sufficient to the meta design. In the rush to pave over the cracks that emerge as ubiquitous or planetary scale computation scales up, in the impulse to overcome the contradictions of either instrumental modes of reason or political economy through design paradigms, how is it that political problems are also transformed, altered, and displaced in this process? Um, so in some ways, uh, I'm, I'm at the end of my talk, um, but uh, yeah, in some ways looking at responsiveness, this kind of fluidity um, that's uh, prioritized as a virtue in contemporary design. Um, it, in some ways, it reminds me of uh, Theodore Adorno's quip uh, on Bergsonian notions of intuition, where he states, quote, the dialectical salts was washed away in an undifferentiated tide in favor of a cult of irrational immediacy, of sovereign freedom in the midst of unfreedom, end quote. So certainly, uh, to the extent that we... Uh, are experiencing a resurgent interest in design thinking, um, both uh, from industry and I would suggest from uh, you know, progressive theory, um, it might be worth us uh, taking seriously uh, the histories of, the designs, uh, of design thinking um, and problematizing the techniques and discourses um, that are brought to bear on our present, um, if only to develop and expand experimental methodologies um, with our computational environments. And that's the end. <laughs>